Well, welcome to King Cup Presentations, the Marco Polo Uno Mucho Show, and tonight uh, we have Mark Slade tribute to Mark Slade. Uh, he's my father, Mark Slade, and uh, he died on Tuesday at 91 years old. And I'm going to do a couple of songs as a tribute. Uh, I was up late last night. I'm really tired, but I got a couple beers in me and see how it goes. And I'm looking up all these esoteric tunes that nobody's uploaded the chords for, but <clears throat> I came across a, a website called Cordy or something where you can plug in the tune and we'll give you the chords. And, you know, I haven't had any time to practice or figure out the tabs or the pickings, and we're just going to fake our way through it. And uh, my son's got my best guitar, and so I'm working with a couple of old crank pieces of modern architecture. You know, CNC, computer to construction, directly. So, uh, just a brief uh, outline about my father. My father uh, was born on March 19th, 23. He died August 12th, uh, 2014, a few days ago. Just missed uh, the International Left Handed Day by one day. You know, he should have hung in for another day because. Wednesday was the official, August 13th was the official left-handed day, and he was left-handed, ambidextrous actually, because they, back in his day they had the ink wells all on the school desks on the right hand to upside, and so anyone who was left-handed, which is about 10% of our population, was forced to uh, switch to their right hand so that they wouldn't smear the ink all across the page, and so left-handed people right like this. Of course, Leonardo da Vinci was left-handed as well. And the text was right-handed, left right-handed. Um, so, my father, well, he was born to a tool and die maker whose father was a clock maker, I believe. Um, making clocks at a period of history when uh, GE was putting electric clocks in every office and school classroom and putting them onto the electric stoves and he was still making handmade clocks. He actually made the cogs and the gears all by hand on a little lathe um, and someone else would make the case and, and uh, if you're into I think it's called holog holography or something like that. The study of watches and clocks. Um, his name would be on the record for his contribution to the uh, art of clock making because he created the world's first eight day clock that went into a grandfather, a wasp waist, rather than a grandmother. I got that backwards. Anyway, very narrow waist clock that you could wind up and it would go gong on the hour. Um, so, anyway, he began his career walking around the meadows of, you know, gardens of England. Um, I'm not going to give away all the family secrets, you know. And there's a great shot of him in his arrogant pose with his walking stick at 17 years old, leaning back on a, on a, a bench and um, very arrogant looking. I think I think I think my brother Jim sort of unfortunately inherited that thing, but at the same time, both. He and my father were able to turn that into a positive thing uh, in their own way. Um, and his dream was to become a, a famous writer or a, 
you know, successful writer. But, you know, time got in the way and things move on. And he uh, worked in the factory for a while and realized he didn't want to do that. So he got himself a teacher certificate. And uh, he taught in a little place called Punnettstown, which is where my mother's from. I met my mother there. Uh, before coming to Canada and, and sequestering himself into the great white north of northern Ontario. So he was in a beautiful countryside, but quite lonely, I suppose, and asked my mother to come to Canada, and, and she did, and the rest is kind of history, and they had a family, and my dad, under pressure, uh, he was teaching in, in northern Ontario. I think he worked for social services as well as my other brother eldest brother, full brother, did. And then um, doing rather nasty work, uh, you know, taking kids away from families that were unstable for various reasons. Um, and then somehow he landed a, a, a much better job with the... Um, Ministry of Education of Ontario, um, who was interested in studying or incorporating or both um, the effects of television and media in education. Um, I'm not quite sure what period that he did that for. Um, several years before he applied, uh, I guess around 1960, 61, um, 60 I guess it would, would have been, uh, the National Film Board as a film officer won, that was his official title, <laughs> which is rather, rather ironic, because he designed his own career, and his own job, and his own uh, meaning and purpose within the framework of the National Film Board. And he was heavily influenced both by his father, who was a bit of a socialist, commie, raving, ranting lunatic for various reasons, which I cannot divulge at this period of history. Um, Upton Sinclair was definitely a big uh, influence on me. He lent me Upton Sinclair's book. Of course, the photographs in there um, depicted kids in their poverty state and um, my feeling on it was it was too depressing and on one hand but you know a picture tells a thousand words and a thousand lies and, and you know you go thrust a, a, a camera in the late 1800s into uh, poor children's faces of course they're going to look like what the hell is going on and I didn't, I didn't see that they were all that necessarily unhappy, but the great part of that is, is those efforts did um, lead to child labor laws eventually for, took decades, and um, you know, helping the poor, social welfare, blah, blah, blah. But one of the greatest influences was um, no doubt Marshall McLuhan, who in the 50s was writing books about the effects of media and television, and uh, my father definitely incorporated that and even searched Marshall McLuhan out to, um, you know, discuss these issues, and sort of uh, hung his, his hat on, on that peg as, as well. And that was within the framework of the film board. He developed those ideas. And he also very much embraced the youth uh, movement of the 60s. And um, the new ideals of and values of that period. And made them work for him. He embraced many of the experimental filmmakers of the film board. From Ryan Larkin to uh, uh, Arthur Lipset. Uh, McLaren, uh, really, really fantastic filmmakers, and if you haven't seen their films, I 
definitely recommend that you go out and see some of these films because they are quite spectacular even to this day. Um, they, they really haven't been outdone in a lot of respects uh, for their creativity and their, their genius. Um, so, so my father's career sort of peaked out in the late 60s, early 70s in, in some senses and in that, uh, you know, a government that was creating a lot of dead wood in, in, in its um, the big post-war victory parade started changing directions and things got a little heavy and, and uh, my father was able to hold on to his job but he took a two-year promotion as the secretary to the, um, to the film commissioner who was responsible to the Minister of Transportation and Communications. And I believe it was a two-year contract, slightly better paying, and they wanted him to join the club as an executive member and become the film commissioner and then he would have answered to um, the Minister of Transportation and Communications of Canada and run the whole film board but uh, rather than do that he decided to transfer to the west coast a uh, very trendsetter kind of probably the oldest hippie uh, 91 years old in some ways um, moved to Bowen Island the whole back to the land thing you know build yourself a house in the middle of the woods and that was quite a trial and tribulation for him and so he, he kind of cruised through the last uh, decade or so of his career on the west coast. Not many people followed him out here. In fact, a lot of the experimental film bankers of, of the 60s were sort of axed and, and let go of um, rather than supported because uh, they weren't adhering to the, the party line, so to speak, or, or with the changes that were happening. And uh, it's quite tragic, which in some cases uh, with Ryan Larkin and with Arthur. Um, and I, I met a lot of these people as a kid. And I was part of, you know, watching all these films. And I was the official projectionist to run the Bell and Howell, 16 millimeters of high school, with my projectionist card. And got to run around with cameras and microphones and tape decks and all the goodies that were, you know, were part of it. And uh, his other claim to fame um, would be his writing of Language of Change, which was a very inspirational book for students and those uh, interested in film and in media in general, uh, whatever it might be, video, animation, and it was written in a bit of a Buckminster Fuller style, whether you like that or not, run on metaphor, but very captivating and interesting. And it was became pretty much uh, one of the recommended textbooks of any um, film course in the college or universities uh, across Canada or perhaps beyond. And, and my father also did a lot of um, footwork and promotion for the film board and for Canada in general. In Australia, you know, perhaps he was partly responsible for Crocodile Dundee, I don't know. And uh, did a lot of world tours promoting the film board and, and trying to do international uh, kind of cooperative with, um, Film things with other other countries, and of course France and FD have done films together. 1918, was a great kind of uh, docudrama. I regress. Anyway, he retired in the early 80s and uh, spent the next 10 years um, writing a book 
and another book. The first book was called uh, Language of Change, Moving Images of Man. I recently saw a hardcover copy, cover copy of it, brand new, and, and whoever was selling it wanted like $2,500 for a brand new hardcover, but most of them are quite reasonably priced at a couple dollars. They might go up now. <laughs> um, it's a good read. I, I quite enjoyed it. As for Autopsy of the Century, uh, um, Lakshana, Autopsy of the Century, that's a, a bit of a different kettle of fish and it kind of gets very confusing in chapter 3. I mentioned that to my father, you know, you, you go through this ride for chapters 1 and 2 and he said, oh, that was the, the, the hardest uh, um, chapter I had to write. Really struggled and put way too much effort into this book. It wasn't like the stream of consciousness of the um, language of change, which came across so well. Um, it was definitely a, a big, big struggle for him, and he had switched, after resisting it, he had switched to computers and um, to word processing, which, which in some ways made it worse, because he could cut and copy and paste and switch it around. But it, it, there are still some gems in that book, and I was kind of disappointed that I was the only one that read it. <laughs> Everyone prejudged it. And, and to be honest, there's a lot of anger and, and kind of hate, I suppose you could say in the book in a way, um, as far as, as far as, you know, um, I'm not really too sure how, how to say it, but he definitely took the side of um, a more socialist line with it because he had no one else to answer to, he was fairly secure in this, in this situation. Um, and yet there's some great, like I said, gems in that book as well. Um, of course, these are contemporary pieces, of the, the, or Language of Change is a very contemporary piece. This was meant as more of a, you know, portmanteau of all his intellect and education and reading and all that he did. Um, so there you have it. Um, that book, I mean, wasn't really that successful, and, and it doesn't appeal to everybody. And you know, um, I think he may have been a little disappointed by its lack of reception. The review for that book, unlike *Language of Change*, which had a very positive review, um, a review from uh, University of Manitoba. Language of Change, University of McGill, um, was quite critical, and and so it was with the times, you know, the, the post-Trudeau era, the Reaganomics, the Thatcherism, the neoconservatism, the, uh, the erosion of freedoms that continues, and the invasion of privacy that continues, and trying to control a a communication, global communication network that has, has really taken off in directions and ways that were unforeseen by uh, by anyone, really. I don't think McLuhan could have foreseen it, or my father, or certainly not the, the government of the United States, <laughs> who is now trying to regain control all that. But um, anyway, I'm going to play a few songs and uh, I kept trying to keep them simple and I don't have many instruments to play and they're just one-offs. I haven't practiced any. So, cheers and I hope you enjoy it.